ora, no mai, haere mai, and welcome to The World of Words Goes Digital. He kōrero, mati heko o te ao. World of Words Goes Digital celebrates Aotearoa's authors, comedians, musicians and poets who share words of wisdom, inspiration, personal challenges and journeys, culminating in a series of rich and diverse conversations. Welcome to the World of Words. I'm Kevin Chapman, a publisher from uh, Auckland, and uh, I'm here to interview Paul Cleave. Um, this program exists because of the support of Creative New Zealand. In 2018 at WOMAD, Paul and I had a talk on stage. Uh, WOMAD's asked us to reprise that for this, for this program. Um, we won't do exactly the same thing. Um, we'll... Uh, Things have changed, time has passed, and, uh, and Paul is doing some other stuff than what he was two years ago. But we'll, uh, but we'll talk about a writer's life, and we'll talk about uh, all sorts of other stuff. Paul Cleave is a crime writer uh, who is one of New Zealand's best-known overseas uh, uh, writers. Uh, he's published in over 18 languages around the world, and, uh, and his constant interest from both television and film. Uh, people for his um, for his work. So, Paul, welcome. Hi, Kevin. How's it all going there? It's it's all fine in Auckland. It's all fine. Um, so, uh, so since it's been over two years since we did that thing in New Plymouth at WOMAD, uh, mm-hmm. why don't you why don't you just tell me what the highlights of WOMAD 2018 were for you? <sighs> I mean, other than spending time with you. Um, yeah, you know what? It was a fun festival, right? Like, I think we both had a really good time there. Good music, good vibe. Uh, if I remember rightly, I think one of us fell over on stage. I can't remember who. That's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you carrying a beer at the time? No. For a drink? no. No. Water. Water. Okay. Also, oh, you've got no real excuse. No. Uh, yes. But it was a good start to the... Um, I think I've never, you know what, you uh, acted out my greatest fear. Like every time I step up on stage, I worry that I'm going to fall over. Um, and now I know how it looks. So I'm definitely not going to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, if that was your greatest highlight, I, I feel sorry for the musicians. <laughs> no, it, was, it wasn't the highlight of the festival. It was just, the, the, you know, maybe it was a highlight of our session. I'm not sure. Ask the audience. So, so, but what about what I mean? What did you think of it? Oh, it was fun, right? I mean, I know we were, we spent all day there, um, all weekend. Uh, we were there two nights, I, I mm. think. Uh, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of international acts, a lot of, um, I mean, there's some pretty old school music. It was Dr- the Dragon that was there, I, I think. Yeah, Dragon um, was my highlight, I think. Yeah, yeah. But also, you know, you remember the, the end, the final night we were there and they had all this kind of, it was kind of cool um, international musicians up on stage and it was just, you know, it was a really fun festival. And I know we promised each other we were going to go back and, um, but we, <laughs> and we still will. But just, <laughs> you know, like, that's, the, that's the thing. It's always fun, but then, oh, you also have to get, you know, do some work as well and it just hasn't quite timed out again. I know. That band from Mauritania was magnificent the final night. We that were. was the one. Yeah, I mean, that was just a, a really capped off. It was a, a really fun weekend. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a, it's a pretty special place. So um, so you've uh, published 11 novels now? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is 11. Um, hopefully 12 after this year. Um, what about the novels you never published? What about the stuff you wrote that, A, was was never even submitted or stuff that maybe you wrote and was submitted but was never published? Yeah, I mean, you're going back a long way now. Uh, I started writing when I was 19. So, you know, that's, I don't want to say how many years ago, but it's a few. And, you know, like anything, there is experience that comes with with the job. So, you know, at 19, you know, you're not going to write a great novel. I mean, some people will, but I didn't. And uh, so I have maybe seven or eight manuscripts that are, you know, as I say, in the bottom drawer, but really they're just on, you know, on the computer somewhere that I would never look at again or never show to anybody because they're, they're horrible. 
but that's part of the process. You know, since being published, uh, I think in 2004 I got signed up, and that hasn't happened. Everything I've, I've written, you know, I've submitted, and it's, it's been okay. However, in saying that, I still have the nerves. Like every time I submit something, I keep thinking this is going to be the time, you know. And you know, I know a bunch of authors, and it's a very common, you know, it's a common thing. Uh, but yeah, so there are a few. Um, I've also got, I think, two or three novels at the moment, which are sitting around fifty, sixty thousand words, which you know you feel like you put a lot of work into that, but then you can see that they're not just they're not working, or they're not really going anywhere. And, you know, I've had one of these for almost 10 years that I come back to every now and then, but, you know, I don't want to risk, you know, forcing it and, uh, and having a bad book. Uh, you know, I just move on from them and just keep going with what's working. Yeah. Yeah. So did you ever get anything rejected? Oh, yeah, plenty. I mean, you know, again, this is before I got published, but, uh, I mean, I couldn't tell you how many, um, a lot. You know, it was, Judy was the cleaner. Actually, that was the first book that I was really submitting around. Um, prior to that, I don't think I, I, uh, I might have actually sent some synopsis and some, you know, early chapters for, for previous books, just the one or two before that. You know, the first four or five my practice books, I, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. So it happened, it happened with The Cleaner. You know, it was the rejection was the humor uh, horror mix um, or crime mix didn't work, whereas that's a really common thing now. I think Dex are kind of paved the way american psycho paved the way right. for, that, for that thing. but it was difficult at the time because i was submitting the cleaner um before that i was submitting the cleaner back in 2000 you know and everyone was going this is you know it's too sort of far out there and then two years later when i was still submitting it they were all going oh it's been done you know they did it with dexter and i felt like i'd really sort of you know missed out each way uh, and it took a couple more years to get that book signed up and then of course it you know it sold really well and uh, and it's led to 10 other books now with, with more on the way. Right, right. Um, so when The Cleaner was was uh, was accepted for publication, that was in New Zealand. You wouldn't have expected it to have yeah. gone on and sold hundreds of thousands around the world. No, not at all. I, I remember, I remember when, I, when I first got told it was being signed up, it was, um, it was sort of early 2000 and five and i had to wait 18 months for the book to come out and that was a very very long 18 months um but yeah you only sort of think about you know well a book will come out here then it got signed up in australia as well you know and you, you don't you, you think well hey you know maybe the uk might come on board maybe uh, america might come on board that's the goal and then suddenly it's you know itself into germany and then France, and then Czech Republic, and then Russia, and all these countries you don't really think about, you know, when it's like, hey, I want to be a writer, you know, you don't tend to think of, you know, Eastern uh, Europe, but no, it's, uh, you know, it's sold through, you know, almost 20 countries, and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's done really well. Yeah, it has, and, uh, and how did that change things for you? Uh, it changed things significantly, actually. It, you know, at the time I was, you know, I was kind of writing full, well, I was trying to write full time. Uh, I was also renovating houses. Um, so once the cleaner uh, took off and, you know, it came out here 2006, it came out in Germany 2007 uh, and, you know, other countries 2007. And then I started earning real hit checks from it in 2008. You know, so, you know, I was able to, uh, you know, buy a nicer house and uh, stop renovating and, and just focus on uh, full time. So I've been, you know, I've done nothing else other than, than write uh, full time for 12 years now. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, it changed, so it changed my living circumstances, but it also changed um, my life in the sense that, you know, it unlocked the world for me. I was never really, uh, you know, traveling was not a big deal to me. I didn't go to Europe until I was, I think, like 36, 37. I had no interest in it. Uh, but, you know, then the books came along and, and, and that, you know, I started traveling for that and then I got the, the bug for that. So more than anything, it's introduced me to, um, you know, other countries, other cultures, um, other people. You know, I have 
almost I probably have more friends now scattered around the world than, than what I do in, in New Zealand and that's why I still like to travel so much so the books you know not just the cleaner but all the books have given me that life now so your first eight novels um, uh, featuring Tate Schroeder Middleton um, they're they're a sort of loose grouping. They're, they're almost a series. Um, mm-hmm. Was that was that planned? No, not at all. Uh, because you know, in the beginning with the cleaner, you know, that was going to be a standalone. Cemetery Lake, which is um, you know uh, Theodore Tate's first novel, was going to be a standalone. You know, Schroeder, he's in the cleaner. I mean, these are characters that I, I had no intention of bringing back. Um, but you know, then they they came out, and people like characters, and people email you and they ask you on stage, you know, when's Joe coming back? When's Tate coming back? So yeah, I absolutely thought, Hey, I, you know, these are likable people, um, people, you know, let's do it. So the book started to evolve. Uh, I brought them back. The problem with that is, you know, you never had uh, any kind of long-term plot. So you start to realize, like, I remember writing book eight, which is five minutes alone. And I wanted to tell a story about how, Theodore Tate met his wife, and I had no idea if I mentioned that in any of the previous books. And that had just been like a day, you know, flicking through the books and looking for any kind of reference to his to his wife. Like in TV, you have what's called a Bible, you know, so you you establish character, their arcs, you know, in the past, who they are, who they're going to be. It's all in there, but I didn't have that with uh, you know with these books. So it has been tricky, but also. You know, they, uh, you know, coming back to those characters for me is, it feels very familiar and I, you know, I enjoy spending time with them and letting them evolve and seeing what's next. But, you know, like you're saying, that was the first eight. And, and then what happened is I wanted to do a couple of standalones. Uh, so then I wrote, I think Trust No One was next. Yeah. Uh, and did uh, Killer Harvest, which was an idea that I had, you know, many years ago that, that I keep wanting to come back to. So it felt time for that. You know, uh, and then of course, whatever it takes. And now, you know, this year's book is another standalone. So that's not to say I'm not coming back to those characters from the original eight, Joe and Tate, because I really like them. But I've also enjoyed sort of, you know, trying to see what else I can, you know, I, I can do. Uh, so, you know, I'll be back. Yeah. Trust no one was very different. And it feels like that was the first real standalone. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and you quite like the idea of writing about crime writers, don't you? Yeah, as as he says in the book, you know, write what you know, because you know what people aren't aware of yet is this year's book, which we're, which will be out later on, is is also about crime writers. So it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously it's something you can you can write quite accurately because you can share some of your experiences, you know, in, in the pages. And uh, and when you first pitched Killer Harvest to me, you pitched it as a YA novel. Um, mm-hmm. I think most of us around the world published it as a crossover novel. Um, mm-hmm. uh, did you want to write YA? What was the... What was the... Yeah, I, I did, actually. It was, it was an idea one of my publishers had uh, years ago, my, my German editor, who just said, you know, there are so many contemporary crime writers who are you know, branching over to young adult you know, would you consider doing this? Because if you did, you know, we think it could, you know, open a different market for you. Because what will happen is that adult readers would still read your young adult uh, books. And then, of course, you know, young adults who read your book as they get older will then go into your, into your normal ones. So, yeah, I wrote, wrote, this, um, wrote this book, you know, Killer Harvest. And you know, my, my protagonist, I think, is 15 or 16. You know, so I wrote it thinking it was going to be a young adult novel. And, uh, and then I remember pitching it to my American publisher and she was saying this is sounding more like an adult book and when I sent her the manuscript she was like this is definitely you know not a young adult so then I went back you know, once I knew that I went back to you know out of the bunch of swearing and, and sort of you know made it more of, a, of an adult novel uh, but you know ideally you know I, I still like the idea of doing a, a young adult at some point uh, so I think it's you know it's a, it's a good thing to do. Do you um do you think there's a difference in uh, level of threat of uh, of terror between YA and adult? 
I'm not sure what you mean on that one. Well, you know, there's a darkness. There's a there's a, there's oh, a menace. Okay. There's a menace. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember the first thing my, um, I have a friend who writes Young Adult and he gave me some, some pieces of advice. And he said there are certainly adult themes that you don't want to touch on. He said, or, uh, but then there are others as well. Like you can have sex in a young adult novel, for example, as long as it's relevant to the, to the plot. So it's, there are many things that you can, you can do because, you know, young adult novels are still for kids who are, you know, like teenagers. So, you know, they know, know everything that's, that's going on. But I would definitely dial back, you know, some of the violence, um, you know. Like, I mean, I, I never write that gratuitously anyway. Uh, people kind of think the books are because they are quite dark and they are quite violent, but most of the darkness happens off page. But people aren't really aware of that at the time. Um, but with, with young adults, yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely, um, you know, dial it down uh, if I was to try again. Yeah, it is amazing how, how, how violent people think your books are, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Considering mm -hmm. I get the actual violence is in them. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those, it's almost a pet peeve for me in, in a way. Uh, it's, you know, it's often a, a first reaction and, you know, it's like, well, you describe this and this and you'll be like, yeah, but, but it's not really, you know. Um, but I think it's, it's also quite cool as well, I guess. That, you know, the thing, the thing is that, you know, not uh, we've all seen so many episodes of CSI and we've all seen a lot of horror movies and we've all seen a lot of crime, crime movies. So you know, you know what's going on. You don't always need to see everything. Uh, you know, so I try to keep as much of it off page as I can um, and just keep it lean. Yeah, yeah. I... Um... No, I'd, I'd be I'd be taking it as a as a, as a compliment if I were you. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I think I'm. I, sh I shouldn't have said that actually. It's you know we <laughs> edited that out maybe, but uh, yeah. No, people do tend to think they are darker than than what they are. So now, Paul, I'd, I'm, I'm, I'd like to talk a wee bit about your last book, uh, whatever it takes, because it was a, your, your, the last book you published, not your last book, um, because, it's a, because it's a substantial departure. Uh, it's a departure because, to my mind, it became more thrillerish mm -hmm. in style than any of your previous novels. And it's a departure because not only is it not set in Christchurch, it's not even set in New Zealand. It's set on the western side of the US. So, mm -hmm. so first, why the change in geography? The book wasn't going to work here. I mean, you know that within one page of reading that novel that it just couldn't happen in New Zealand. Sorry. The reason for that is I needed a, a really isolated small town with an isolated small town police force. Um, you know, if that book was to happen here, then immediately, you know, somebody in the police would ring the next police department down the road and they'd have all kind of backup and, you know, other people to, to assist. Whereas I needed, you know, an environment where the police force that are there, that's it. There's nobody else. There's no other, other help. Uh, so that really limited it, you know. There was just no way it could happen here. And I remember I discussed this with you for, you know, for a year on and off. You know, is there a way we can try to make it work here in New Zealand? Because I felt very loyal to, you know, to my readers who love the New Zealand uh, location. You know, I wanted to set it here because I do like, you know, New Zealand as a setting. But just the story could not have been told here. So once, you know, once we knew that was the case then it was a matter of just making the best of it. 
And I've got to say, within, you know, as, as I was writing it, I actually, you know, really came to love this small town that it set in uh, to the point where, you know, the book that I wrote after that is set in the same small town because I really like these characters. I like the geography. I like the location. The location and the story lent itself to more of a thriller, you know, an action thriller than any other kind of book. Like most of them are quite psychological. This was more like something I'd wanted to do in, in a long time. You know, very, uh, you know like it's a real thriller uh, story. But also because it's set in a small town in the USA, it changes the cadence as well. It changes the, you know, the vernacular. <clears throat> Your characters are talking differently, different speech patterns. You know, so then <clears throat> it changes everything. So you're just in a, in a whole different world. But it's the kind of world that you just slip into very easily. And what I would say is that book's been out for, I think, uh, <clears throat> roughly a year now. Uh, it came out in France last year as well, which is one of my, my biggest markets. It comes out in Germany uh, next year. Uh, <clears throat> among other countries, it's out in the US now. It's out in the UK now. Uh, but what I would say is that so far everybody has loved the location, and I was worried about that. So I thought, you know, people are loyal to, you know, to the books being set here, uh, but you know, everyone's loved it, so it's it's gone well. So you know, it will be a location that I will bring back. You know, again, I was saying I have the next book set there, not not the one coming out this year, but the one after. Uh, but it is a location that that I will continue to you know evolve. Um, you know, over the next, uh, well, we'll see how long it, it goes. Had a different sort of uh, central character too, uh, sort of a wimpish Jack Reacher. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, with Jack Reacher, you've got a guy who's already killed, you know, many, many people, uh, you know, almost like a serial killer, perhaps. But, you know, I wanted to have a character who kind of gets to that point but has never killed anybody. So, you know, he does feel shock at the actions, at the way things unfold. You know, he, he considers his choices, you know, rather than just, you, know, you see it in books all the time where it's like, well, I'll just kill that character because that's what my guy does and it's easy to do. And I, I wanted to have a guy who, you know, is conflicted about it. He's confronted by, by his actions. And you see the very evolution of, of when it first happens because, yeah, like, like most of the books, you know, this guy ends up killing people, but it's not an easy thing for him. And, and there's a, a real moment in the book where he's, he can go either way, you know, he gets to choose his, his path. So that made it, um, you know, quite different from the other books as well. I think from, from most other sort of uh, heroes. And without giving anything away, the ending does leave an opening for for that character to go on. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, the story wraps up. It's not, it's not an open, you know, ending where you go, oh, what happened next? But there's just a little uh, bit of a hint there that, you know, that there can be more uh, to come along if, if I want to. And I, and I really did like that character. And I had a lot of fun with him. And, you know, he evolved in a way where he's, he's learning from his mistakes. And it would be good to bring him back. And I, I think I will. But again, <laughs> You know, I've still got Joe to bring back from the cleaner and Tate to bring back and others. And, and they're all sort of in the back of my mind at any given moment. So it's just a matter of, of finding time. What would be really great would just be have one book where they can all come back together and just hang out. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, Christchurch meets Acacia Pines. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he wins a trip to Christchurch or something like that. Or, you know, or maybe all my guys from here leave to go over there because they need a break. From all the murders. From all the murders, yeah. Yeah. Um, whatever it takes is quite filmic as well. Very. Yeah, it's, it's very visual. Um, you know, I always try to do that with the books. I, I do my best to bring people, you know, into the, into the novel. And that's why Christchurch was always good for me as well, because, you know, I live here and I can describe it. So I can bring international readers into, you know, into my version of Christchurch. Not Christchurch but my, my version of it, which is quite different as well. But, you know, you can describe things and you know how long it takes for your character to get, you know, to get somewhere. Whereas Acacia Pines, I didn't have that. It was just, you know, I had to draw maps, you know, in my notebook of, you know, of where locations are and start to, to build up that world so I could you know, have some kind of accuracy in it. 
So talking about Christchurch, just to go back to that, it's mm-hmm. been nine years since the, uh, since the earthquakes. Um, the earthquakes haven't troubled your, your novels at all. Uh, no. Been tempted? <clears throat> no. I mean, I couldn't do it. Uh, the main reason is continuity because when, uh, when the earthquakes happened, I was already, I had book five, which was collecting Cooper. And that has, you know, the reoccurring city, the reoccurring characters. This book had already gone through editing and was, was pretty much good to go. So I couldn't put the earthquake into the back, you know, into that book. It was too late. And even if I could, it wouldn't have worked because, you know, it shares the same timeline. So you would have to have had, you know, the other characters have never mentioned it, you know, and it would be like, if I put it into one of the books now, it will be like, Oh, do you remember that earthquake? None of us spoke about in the last four or five books. That's what it would have been like at the time. So it would have just, it would have been too awkward to, to put it in there. And now of course, so much time has passed anyway. Um, so, you know, and, and even though some of the books are standalones, you know, they still share the same universe. So it just has to be the way it is. I, I mean, you know, I think, you know, I, well, actually, I, I like it. I like having a earthquake-free version of Christchurch. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would like an earthquake-free version of Christchurch. Cool. Um, so what about uh, film and television? Mm-hmm. Well, that's always a tricky one to answer because you always have a couple of lions in the fire. Um, we've had them before. As you know, we're having them again with not just the, the series of the, of the books, um, but, you know, there's, there's, a, there's something else that's going on as, as well with, with one of the books that, you know, we're hoping to get some, some movie interest. I've got a couple of people working on that at the moment. Uh, so things are um, hopeful, I'd say, rather than, than promising. Uh, that's what TV and and movie is always like. You know, you just you've just got to let everyone behind the scenes take care of it. And if you get really excited, then you know you're prone for for being let down. But uh, but I'm saying that you know I'm pretty you know I'm feeling quietly confident uh, that we're going to see something happen uh, movie wise for one of the books, and that we're going to see something happen TV wise for for a bunch of them as well. But they take time. You know, writing a book. You know, if I was to start writing a book today you know, then we'd be editing that thing in six months and that thing would be coming out, you know, uh, this time next year. TV, movie is not like that. It's, it works at a, at a snail pace. Uh, you know, there is, there's just a lot more going on. Um, the author doesn't really have a lot of involvement. You know, you're, you're the last guy. Like I, I learned yesterday where things are at with, with uh, you know, with this potential movie and, you know, everybody else is known for like a month or two. Um, so you've just got to be patient and, and sit back, but you know, we could be talking three or four or five years, you know, who knows, or, or maybe suddenly things, uh, accelerate. Uh, what I do know is that at the moment, nothing is being made anyway. You know, COVID has sort of stopped the movie industry. Things are getting developed, uh, but nothing is actually being filmed. And what did COVID change for you? Not a lot in the beginning, to be honest. You know, I work from home, so it was just, you know, um, really the biggest thing was a queue at the supermarket. That was the only thing for a while. Um, I went running a lot. I spent a lot of time jogging the streets. I discovered there's this weird thing that pedestrians do. I think pedestrians feel like they own the footpath. So no one would move aside. So, you know, as a runner, you know, you'd be moving this way and the pedestrian would just, you know, stay straight. Um, but it's interesting because I know a lot of runners and everybody was saying the same thing. Uh, but aside from that, that was, that was what I learned about, uh, you know, about society. Um, I didn't really do a lot of work for the first, I don't know, four weeks, five weeks. Uh, again, you know, I know other authors who were the same. It was difficult. It's difficult to feel creative when, you know, the world outside the window is burning. Not here in New Zealand, uh, but definitely, you know, overseas. Um, it's difficult when you, 
when you know um, there are going to be many delays, you know, like, I mean, my, my book got delayed, everything got delayed, um, you know, all the bookshops in the world are closed, so people aren't buying books. So you, you do sort of feel that, well, there's no real urgency to write at the moment. Uh, but that passed, you know, I think four or five weeks in, then, you know, we started working again on this on this book. And as, as you know, you know, you, you found me an editor and, and now the last two or three weeks has just been, you know, full on 10, 12 hour days, <clears throat> getting this book into, into shape so we can you know, make this, uh, this deadline for this year. Um, just as, as, as somebody that walked a lot during lockdown, I'd just like to say that I found that runners never deviated. Uh, right, right. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. I was always um, out on the road if I could or, or making, you know, making an, an effort. I only, like, I was running three or four times a week, each time, you know, 5, 10K, and, and only twice did, did you know, the person coming opposite me move as well as, as, as I did. So maybe it's a Christchurch thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Listen, you, um, you've won uh, the Samar Award in France. You've been shortlisted for the Edgar and the Barry and the Ned Kelly. You've won the Nio Marsh in New Zealand three times. I think the only person that's won it more than once. Um, what do awards mean? Uh, they mean people are reading the books for a start, which is quite nice. You know, it's it's weird. They actually are quite important because, you know, it brings more attention, especially, you know, the one in, in New Zealand, the Naya Marsh Award, which, you know, Craig Sisterson sorted out, oh, I think it was like 10 years ago, 2010 maybe, Probably. 9, 10, something like that. Uh, it's just, it helps raise an awareness of, you know, of not just the books, but just the genre in general. You know, 10 years ago, probably not a lot of people were buying New Zealand crime writing. Uh, there wasn't a lot of New Zealand crime novels that were coming out. Uh, I think at the time, The Cleaner was was one of the only ones, and within a couple of years, there was a couple. Whereas now, with New Zealand, you're looking, I think they get 60 or 70 uh, books submitted for the award. Uh, so it's been it's been huge. So that's, you know, it's been good for, for all of us. So the awards, you know, they also... Um, kind of help you feel like a little validated, you know, you were saying, well, you're putting a lot of work into the book and you're doing the best you can. And it's always great, you know, to have uh, buying them. That's important uh, more than anything, really. But also when you have your peers judge you, you know, and, um, you know, shortlist you or, or give you an award, then you feel like you're, you're up there with, with guys you admire. So it's important for, I think self-esteem and, and ego is as well. Like, I mean, you do feel like you have a real job because to be, to be honest, there's always this sense that um, ever since I was published that you're going to wake up one day and somebody's going to say to you, Oh, I'm sorry, but it's been a mistake. We're going to take everything away from you. Uh, so the awards help, you know, cement that, you know, that what you're doing is okay. It's good to know you're not the other only one that su suffers from imposter syndrome. Do, do <laughs> festivals, do festivals give you the same sort of validation? I mean, you attend a lot of festivals around the world. Absolutely. Uh, more than anything, I would say, you know, you go to festivals, you meet people. Uh, I mean, there are two things. First of all, you're meeting other authors, and then you realise that all the fears that you've had as a, as a writer is common, you know. Uh, every We all have it, you know. So you realise um, you're part of a, of a society in, in, a, in a way. Um, but also it's... It's having readers come along. You know, you see people are uh, buying and enjoying uh, the books. It's, you know, this all, um, oh, what do I want to say? That, that just, you know, you feel, uh, again, you feel, I mean, it's part of being, you know, being validated, but also it's just really nice, you know, that people make the effort. They're always really friendly. You know, you're always signing books. Now it's, these days you're signing books and taking photographs and, you know, and of course you get to travel. You get to go to all these countries and, and do that. Uh, but it's just a really good time. It's always, you know, a really good vibe. You're interacting with, you know, with publishers, editors, um, readers, other authors. It is, I think, without a doubt, the best part of, of the job. Hmm. Oh, I, I know some writers that say the best part is getting a check. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's not as often, but uh, I mean, that's good too. Um, 
when you go to festivals and when you travel, you throw frisbees. What's that about? Well, the frisbee thing sort of started before the, the books. Uh, you know, it was just I wanted something that I could do in every country that, I, that I've been to, something quite unique. You know, I know a lot of people collect like pens or key rings or cups or whatever. Uh, so when I first went to Europe, Back in 2008, I just happened to have a frisbee in my bag. I had no intention of doing this, you know. And then suddenly, I was sort of throwing it in a bunch of countries, and I ended up making a list. And I think I went to like 11 countries on that trip. But then it became this thing of like, hey, I want to add add more countries. So I'm always actively looking for new places to go. You know, I can say this year I had I think 13 or 14 new places lined up. I was, you know, back in March, I was going to be in Norway, Morocco, Portugal, Israel, Jordan, among others. You know, I was actually, as we're speaking right now, <clears throat> today I should have been in Machu Picchu in Peru, throwing it there. You know, I would have been in the Dominican Republic next week, um, through the Caribbean, things like that. So, you know, I'm always actively looking uh, for somewhere new to go. So if you're going to a festival anyway, let's say you're going to France, it's like, okay, well, what's, what else is nearby? You know, but what's been happening is that, you've got to start expanding, you know, because if I go to France, it's like, okay, well, I've been to every country that borders France. What about Germany? I've been to every country that borders Germany as well. So you are getting, you know, taking longer and longer flights every time, but it's fun. And it's also a way to meet people as well. You know, it's sometimes you're in countries alone. And like I was in Qatar last year and, you know, you just, you approach strangers and you, you you sort of, you know, they must think I'm nine years old or something. You're saying, hey, you know, I have this weird thing. Would you mind throwing a frisbee with me? But it always works out pretty well. It's really tough when one of the biggest problems you have is approaching strangers in a foreign country to throw a frisbee with you. Um, it's, a yeah, tough life. it's a tough life being a successful writer. My first world problem, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's all we have time for. Um, thanks, okay. Paul. Thanks for your time and your insights. Uh, Thanks to Creative New Zealand for helping make this whole thing happen and to WOMAD for bringing it to screen. And, uh, and I hope that, uh, that all of you who are watching look out for more WOMAD uh, um, uh, digital uh, whatevers. <laughs> you know Thanks, what I mean? Kevin. I'd do that. Is- all right, mate. Cheers. All right. See ya. I think, I, think I, need to, I think I need to do that close again. But anyway, what the fuck is it called again? Will the words on screen? Oh, I'm not sure. World of words goes digital. Mm. Well, it looks well. like our time is up, Paul. Looks like our time is up. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time and your insights. And uh, thanks to Creative New Zealand for helping bring this thing to the screen. Thanks to WOMAD for making it happen. And, uh, and I hope you all find uh, other things at World of Words Goes Digital to have a look at. Thanks, Kevin. It was a pleasure. Bye. These conversations are proudly presented by WOMAD New Zealand with the support of Creative New Zealand. For us as New Zealanders, I think, um, it's a really interesting and important way of getting our voices out internationally as well. Mm